Good evening, CR family, and uh, new faces as well. Welcome. Um, just for the record, I will not be forming a bunch of questions that you have to say yes to. But Eric and I were just talking about, Eric likes to give me little challenges, and so far, I've had to have a quote from Point Break in a lesson. I've had to incorporate the word pink socks into a lesson. And by the way, somebody walked in that night wearing pink socks. And, and then he, he had me tell three jokes during, during a lesson. So he told me there would be more challenges coming, but I, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to meet that challenge tonight. Um, our topic is on yes, but before we get started, I'd love to open us in prayer. Well, Heavenly Father, we thank you for um, the opportunity to come together, um, Lord, to, um, to worship you, to learn from you, to surrender our hurts, habits, and hang-ups, to support one another in our recovery and our healing, um, and a place, Lord, where we can come and just be real and be ourselves. Lord, just uh, bless the teaching this evening. Um, just pray that those that uh, need to hear it get, get from it what they need to get from it, Lord, that it um, speaks to each person uh, where they're at. Uh, be with me, Lord, and, and uh, guide me in what you would have me say and what you would have me not say, and bless this evening in Jesus' name, amen. So those of you who don't know me, I realize I didn't say who I am. Uh, my name's Tom. I'm one of the pastors here on staff. I'm also a recovered drug addict and alcoholic and a member of Celebrate Recovery. So we're on principle eight and step 12 tonight. Very quickly read those to you. Principle eight says, yield myself to God to be used to bring this good news to others, both by my example and by my words. Happy are those who are persecuted because they do what God requires, Matthew 5, 10. And step 12, having had a spiritual experience as a result of these steps, we try to carry this message to others and practice these principles in all our affairs. Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore the person gently, but watch yourselves or you also may be tempted, Galatians 6, 1. So with every teaching, there's typically an acrostic. I'm going to give you that acrostic tonight, and then we're going to move on. <laughs> so I'm going to give it to you very quickly, those of you who are taking notes. Uh, our word for tonight is yes, and the Y stands for yield myself to God. Y is yield myself to God. Um, and I just put a little note here, ongoing surrender uh, out of reverence and joy. And we'll come back to that idea a little bit more tonight. But ongoing surrender out of reverence and joy. Yield myself to God. E is example is what is important. Example is what is important. And what that means is that you are now an example. And so I wrote, be the salt by making people thirsty for the living water. Your life should be attractive to people in a way that makes them want to ask you how you live the way you live. And that's your opening to say, I live by Christ, right? I live through Jesus Christ. So Make them thirsty for the living water. That's what it means to be salt. We make people thirsty. S says, serve others as Jesus did. Serve others as Jesus did. Service brought about the gratitude of one who knows they have been bought at a price. Right? You've been bought at a price. Your recovery's been bought at a price by the blood of the lamb. So serve others as Jesus did out of your gratitude for what he did for you. And then I want to talk just a little bit about breaking down step 12. And first of all, I'm going to take a little bit of issue with having had a spiritual experience. Um, I won't mention other programs, but I'll say other programs word this differently. They say having had a spiritual awakening. And you might ask yourself, what's the difference? Why do I care about the wording? What does it matter? Well, it matters a lot. Because a spiritual experience is a sudden reversal change in a person. It happens often instantaneously. It happens, people will describe it as being baptized in the Holy Spirit or having the Spirit overcome them. If we're working the steps, we're having a similar experience incrementally, and we call that an awakening. So I like that word awakening a lot better because it happens gradually. Most of us don't get that instantaneous experience. Hey, if you did, awesome. Great, you might get it in regards to something else, but still not have it in regards to your recovery. Doesn't mean you're doing something wrong. That's why we have the steps and why we do those things incrementally. So it's having had a spiritual awakening. And if you think about that word, it's also helpful because the scripture says, wake, O sleeper. 
Wake, O sleeper. What are we awakening to? We're awakening to the truth about who we are in Christ, who he is, and we're doing that over time. And we'll come back to that theme a little bit tonight too. And then what's this the result of? Well, it's the result of the steps. And you've heard me say this before. I don't think it can be said enough because if you haven't already been confronted with this, you will be. And that is, well, why do we need steps at all? If Jesus is the solution and Jesus is the answer and Jesus can do all things, then why in the world do I even need something like a 12-step program? We were just having this conversation with someone this weekend, another pastor and myself, because they were going, well, I don't think, I don't have addiction. And I said, well, it's for anybody with any hurt, habit, or hang-up, and I haven't met anybody without one of those. So you, can, you, you qualify, you can work the steps, you can be here. And they didn't understand why they would need that. Well, think about it this way. Think about whatever you're here to deal with, whatever your hurt, habit, or hang-up is. If you could have just laid that at the feet of the Lord, you probably wouldn't be here with us this evening, right? I, I wouldn't be if I had just been able to wake up one day and go, you know what, I really shouldn't use drugs and alcohol. Jesus, here you go, and now I'm done. If I could do that, I wouldn't have been here. Well, the steps help us to do that. They're the process by which we learn to really surrender those things and lay them, whatever they are, whatever issue we're dealing with, at Jesus' feet and really give them to him, leave them at the foot of the cross. And that's why we work the 12 steps. And then what do we do? Well, we try to carry this message to others. And I don't really like this word try either. Um, I had a, a good friend who taught me this trick, and I used to do this in counseling. I would throw a pin on the floor, and then I would tell somebody to try to pick it up. And they would pick it up, and I'd tell them to throw it back on the floor and try to pick it up. And they would pick it up, and I'd say, throw it back on the floor and try to pick it up. You get the point, right? I think Yoda said there is no try, only do, right? We might not do it well. We may not do it perfect all the time, but we're going to carry the message to others. In fact, we are carrying a message to others all the time. Every time you interact with somebody, every time you go somewhere, every time you talk to your spouse, your kids, your friends, the bus driver, your boss, you are carrying some sort of message. So there's no trying to carry a message. You're always carrying a message. But what message are you carrying and how are you carrying it? So this idea that we're going to try, what we're going to do is we're going to try to do the best message. So you're always carrying a message. There's no trying to carry a message. Does that make sense? So carry, carry the message. What's that? Well, that's freedom in Christ. And to practice these principles in all our affairs. Every step, we, we read the eight principles all the time. But every step has an inherent principle in it as well. And if you've got a sponsor, an accountability partner, or even in your discussion group, it would be good for time to time to review those and what are they and how are we living them out and walking them out in our lives. And again, it kind of brings us around in a circle because as we walk those principles out, those things are the things that are attractive to others. Those are the things that give us the opportunity to have a conversation and to share our victory with others. We've been talking a lot in care ministry lately about the importance of leading and speaking out of victory. You know, if I was up here tonight and I was talking to you and I was drunk, or you knew I got drunk last night, my message wouldn't mean a whole lot to you, right? So we speak out of and we lead out of our victory. We lead out of the message people want to hear is that I'm victorious in Christ over my hurt, habit, and hang up. And so as we live out the principles, that's what illustrates that to others. Because I guarantee you, if you're distracted by your hurt, habit, or hang-up, you're probably not living out these principles. Does that make sense? So some of these things are sort of built into this. So as I was preparing for this, um, Matthew 5.37, But let your yes be yes and your no be no, for whatever is more than these is from the evil one really was standing out to me. Let me read that one more time. Let your yes be yes and your no be no, for whatever is more than these is from the evil one. Not yes, but. Not yes, followed by an explanation. Not yes and no. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. Well, what are we saying yes to? I was talking to Jeff just prior, and um, God is so good, and he's always teaching and giving and talking to us, and one of the things that he shared with me right before I came up here is that we have bookends that represent the great commandments. What are the greatest two commandments? To love God 
with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love our neighbors as ourselves. Steps 1 through 11, folks, are teaching us to love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and removing the things that have prevented us from doing that in our life. And 12 is how we go out and love our neighbor as ourselves. Remember, it's the two of those together. And we can't love our neighbor as ourselves if we don't love ourselves. And we can't love ourselves right if we're still acting out in our hurt habit or hang up. So we can't get the cart before the horse. We do steps 1 through 11 to get to 12. And only then can we effectively go out and love others. Does that make sense? I need to see head nods. People are kind of sleepy tonight. It's cold out. Hot chocolate next week. Okay. All right. And if you want to spike it with coffee, you can have a mocha. All right? And that, that's fancy. Okay. The other thing that, in thinking about this, and, I, and I, I want you to know that a lot of times when I'm up here talking, probably my style of speaking sounds a little bit like I'm talking at you. I'm talking to myself as much as I'm talking to you. I own all this as much as you own this. But the heart behind our yes matters. The heart behind the yes matters. And... It's, um, I actually, we were at a church conference this last week, as Eric mentioned, and I heard the first speaker mention this, and not very many people are talking about this, but interactions between humans are either relational or transactional. And a transactional exchange is one where I'm giving and getting something, and you're giving and getting something, and that's the only purpose for us having that interaction. The problem is, Many of us fall into that habit where all of our human interactions are transactional. That's where we become, we get to using people in our lives rather than knowing that person for who they are, appreciating them for who they are. Really, really, when I ask you how you're doing, I mean it and I want you to tell me rather than I'm just having a transaction. I'm supposed to say something to you and you're supposed to answer and then we're going to go on. That's a transaction. A relation would be I ask you how you're doing in the morning and I really expect to stand and have you tell me and I'm ready to listen to what you have to say to me. That's a relational interaction between people. Well, when we say yes but we're only saying yes for a transaction, that makes our yes hollow. So the heart behind our yes matters. 1 Samuel 16, 1 through 13, the Lord does not see as mortals see. They look on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. God's concerned with your heart. He doesn't care that you have a new fancy hairdo or that you've got a brand new car or that you're a slick speaker he doesn't care about any of that stuff. He cares about your heart because your heart determines the course of your life. And your heart is where your relationship with God resides. So God cares about your heart. And our yes, if we mean it, comes from our heart. Matthew 15, 19, for out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, and blasphemies. Why is that important? Because those are probably a lot of the reasons we're here. Those are our hurts, habits, and hangups. Well, wait, Tom, those are sins. Yep, they're often the same thing. And what we're doing is we're, we are in a process of spiritual transformation. Do you know why this room is not packed? Because it's for people who want it, not for people who need it. I said to you at the beginning, there's not a person that doesn't have a hurt habit or hang-up. So if we were for everybody who needed it, we would have to have it in the main auditorium, and maybe that wouldn't be big enough. But look around. It's spiritual transformation. It's not easy. It's not easy. You have to either be desperate and know you need it, or really have a deep desire, or both or you won't be here and you won't stay here because it's spiritual transformation because it's changing your heart, right? That's the hardest thing. I, I can't do it. Only God can change my heart, but I have to get out of the way and let him. Is this a yes that comes from a deep knowledge of what God has done for you and who he is, or is this compliant consent? I'll say that one more time. Is this a yes that comes from a deep knowledge of what God has done for you and who he is? Or is this compliant consent? 
What's the problem with compliance? Compliance will only take you so far. If we're compliant, eventually one day we won't be compliant. Eventually one day you're going to ask me as my sponsor or my accountability partner or as a trusted friend to do something I'm not willing to do. And if I don't have a heart change, I won't be able to do it. It's not that I'm necessarily bad. It's just that I don't have the necessary change in my life, the transformation necessary to help me to do that. Does that make sense? Well, what do I do if I'm in consent? The good news is you can surrender at any time. Compliance can become surrender at any time. I've heard a lot of messages on my cup runneth over. In fact, I was reading a book from one of the speakers at our conference, and that was one of the first things in her book, and it was a good reminder because it's not God's grace to me that frees me. It's God's grace through me because God's grace comes through me, and I extend it to others. Our cup runneth over. And what's cool about this, why, why does somebody keep working the steps after years and years and years? Because we'll pile crud back in again. We have to keep the cup empty. God can't fill it up if I've got stuff in it already. You know, if it's on the counter keeping your change, God can't fill it up. If it's empty, then God's going to fill it up till it runs over. And it's that continual emptying that allows him to fill that up. And so the steps help us to empty of self so that God's transformational power can fill up our hearts and make the necessary heart change so that I not only desire to give it away, but I can't help myself. You ever been so excited about something that you'll yell to anybody, how come we're not doing that about God? When was the last time you got so excited about Jesus that you just couldn't keep your mouth shut? Well, if we really thought about his power in our lives and his transformational power, that's what we'd be doing all the time. I'm sure most of the people on the airplanes to and from wanted me to shut up but I'm excited. I'm going to share with them. It was great. On the way home, I got to meet this lady from the Philippines who's Catholic, and we had awesome conversation all the way back to Louisville. She's here to visit her daughter. She talked about how important her faith is, that she went to Mass every day prior to COVID, and we talked about how she watches online. It was cool, but it's because I said, I'm a pastor, and I love Jesus. That's why we had that conversation. Are you excited about Jesus? Are you sharing with people? Does your cup run over? It should. It should. Point two, knock and the door will be opened. Your first yes must be yes to Jesus as your Lord and Savior. I don't know if there's anybody in here tonight that doesn't know Jesus that way, doesn't know that uh, he died for you because he did. And if you don't know that and you haven't accepted him into your life, uh, I'd love to talk to you afterwards or talk to one of the leaders in your group. They'd be happy to have that conversation with you. But that's our, that's our first yes. That's the first important yes. But notice that knock and the door will be opened. We've got to part. Our second yes must be our surrendered service to our neighbor. Listen to that again. Our surrendered service to our neighbor. The two greatest commandments. I was, I was thinking through some things that seem conflictual in Scripture, and God has a way of showing me that nothing he says is conflictual. And one of the things I was thinking about was, well, the Scripture tells me that people, other people are supposed to be more important to me than myself. But then the two greatest commandments, the second one says, love my neighbor as myself. So is it greater or is it as? Is it same or is it more? And God said, you'll never get as if you don't overshoot. So the reason he's not conflicting himself, he's saying, I know you good because I made you. I know what you're like, Tom. And if you don't try to overshoot by loving them better, you won't even get even with them. So you better try harder at loving other people than loving yourself or you're not going to make it. I don't know if you've ever noticed those conflicts, but I just solved it for you. Okay. <laughs> you might be the only Bible that anyone's ever heard. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to anyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. 1 Peter 3.15 First of all, do you feel hopeful? 
Do you have hope in you? Can you share that with somebody? What does that look like if you share that with somebody? Why do you have hope? It says be ready to defend it. Okay, you're a hopeful person, Eric, but why? Why do you have hope? How cool to say, you know why I have hope? Because I was a hopeless drunk. One of the uh, speakers at the conference told us we were all morons, but he said it's okay because he's one too. We're all hopeless morons until Jesus enters our life, and then we're hopeful morons, right? That's cool. But my hope comes from the fact that God has worked in my life, and I've seen it and experienced it. It's not a theory. I don't have a theory about how God works in my life. I have experience how God works in my life. There was something that I couldn't overcome. In fact, there was something that was killing me that I couldn't overcome. Think about that for a minute. There was something that was killing me that I couldn't overcome. I couldn't say no to something that was going to literally take my life from me until Jesus entered my life. If that's not a reason for hope, folks, if that's not a reason to be excited to share your experience with God, then I'm not really sure what is. Well, you go, well, Tom, I wasn't dying. I didn't have a cocaine and alcohol addiction. Okay, well, maybe you have a negative attitude. And everywhere you go, people are bummed to see you show up because they go, wah, 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 right? And no one wants to be your friend and you're lonely until Jesus entered your life. And then suddenly you walk in one day and there's a light on on your face and people are like, what in the world? Well, that's pretty cool. That's a testimony. You don't have to be dying to have a testimony. That's awesome. Right? Be hopeful. Share that with people. Your yes to Jesus allows you to say yes to your brother and sister so they can say yes to Jesus and yes to restoration. Let me say that again. I'm really glad the Holy Spirit writes this stuff and not me. Your, your, your yes to Jesus allows you to say yes to your brother or sister so they can say yes to Jesus, so they can say yes to restoration. And I kind of hit on this earlier, but I want to hit on it again. So many Christians, listen, so many Christians lack victory in their lives. I'm going to say, I didn't say people. So many Christians lack victory in their lives. We can only help others from our victory. Why? Because it's not our victory, but Christ's victory in and through us. When you have victory, it's not your victory. Tom didn't defeat alcoholism and drug addiction. Christ defeated it in and through me so that I could be witness to his glory. Why does he say stuff's done again? Oh yeah, to his glory. He says the good things that happen are to his glory. So my restoration wasn't for me. I'm really self-centered and that still blows my mind every time I have to say that because I think it should be about me, but it's not about me. It's about you. It's about people I haven't met yet. It's about people who don't know Jesus yet. You think you're here for you tonight. You're wrong. You're here for everybody that God wants to reach through you. Think about that for a minute. It's awesome. God says... Dallas Willard went so far as to call that the divine conspiracy, that we would be included in God's restoration and God's plan of salvation for the world. Think about that. That's awesome. I said brokenness is ours and victory is God's. Our power is partial, weak, ineffectual. Listen to that again. My power is partial, weak, and ineffectual. But Christ's power is total, universe-making, life-transformating, creating something out of nothing power. Creating something out of nothing power. My life was going nowhere fast. There was nothing happening that had any good impact on anyone for any reason. God took nothing and made something from it. It's power. Last point. Yes is a commitment that leads to covenant. Yes is a commitment that leads to a covenant. Here's the definition of commitment. An engagement or obligation that restricts freedom of action. Listen to that again. A commitment is an engagement or obligation that restricts freedom of action. Many of you who are married think you have a commitment. It's a covenant. I'm just saying. 
Okay. It, <laughs> it's not meant to restrict freedom or action. And we talked about transaction and transactional relationship. Commitments are transactional. And transactional decisions are based on fearing God or, or consequences. Listen to that again. Listen to the relationship. A commitment is a transaction. And a transaction is based on fearing God for the consequences that God may put in your life. That's not a relationship. And you won't pray to that God. And you won't believe that that God's going to help you in your life. Because when we fear something, we hide from it. We don't have relationship. God is a person who loves you, who is your father, who wants to have a relationship with you. That's a covenant. Here's a covenant. Usually formal, solemn, and binding agreement. Binding, formal, solemn. It's a relational decision based on knowing God. It's a relational decision based on knowing God. Now, what's the difference between that? It's like when you decide to marry somebody. You love them. You purposefully and intentionally come into covenant with them. When you know God, you're going to want to have a covenant with God. You'd be crazy not to. So we let our yes be yes because it doesn't need to be anything else. You have sought the kingdom first and everything else was given is being given and will be given for you to accomplish what God has you here on earth to accomplish. You didn't know all that was in the steps, did you? But it is. Jesus says to us, in effect, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. You've, you've, the kingdom is near. Why is the kingdom near? Because the extension of Jesus' effective will is the kingdom. It says, as Christians, we're already citizens there. We're foreigners here. We're citizens there. And as we die to self and we work the steps, we solidify our citizenship. I'll read one more time. You have sought the kingdom first, and everything else was given, is being given, and will be given for you to accomplish what God has you here on earth to accomplish. You're not working on your hurt habit or hang-up for yourself, but what God has for you to do. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for this message. I needed to hear it. I hope others needed to hear it too, Lord. And, and we thank you so much for loving us, for equipping us, for giving us one another, for giving us the steps, for being patient with us, um, for offering many ways to meet you, to get closer to you, to know you, um, to really be free, Lord. I thank you so much for Care Night, for Northside Christian Church that has embraced Celebrate Recovery and understanding that, that we need this. And so, Lord, just a blessing on the discussion groups tonight. Um, Lord, I just pray that uh, those who are here with the burden will be able to lay that burden down to share that, um, to work through it, um, and that for others, maybe this is a time to share for joy and victory and what God is accomplishing, um, and that everyone will, to, will get exactly what they need out of this evening. Thank you for allowing me to share. In Jesus' name, amen.